History and Biography is sponsored by Wells Fargo. Hello, welcome to this session of the National Book Festival, uh, brought to you by the Library of Congress, which is celebrating uh, its 20th year this year. I'm Steve Perlstein. I'm a longtime business and economics columnist at the Washington Post, also a professor at uh, George Mason University, and the author of a book about American capitalism called Moral Capitalism. My guests today are um, Rick Perlstein, who's from the branch of the Pearlstein clan that's uh, very strong on reporting, a little, a little weak on spelling, he spells his name differently, uh, a Milwaukee native, uh, spent some time at a publication called Lingua Franca. He's a man of the left who has written three books uh, chronicling the rise of men on the right, Barry Goldwater, Richard Nixon, and his latest book, uh, Reaganland, America's Right Turn. Also joined today by Nick Lemon, a longtime New Yorker writer, former dean of the Columbia Journalism School, uh, who, like many of his generation in journalism, got his start at the feet of the great editor Charlie Peters at Washington Monthly. He's written books about the SAT and black migration from the South, and his new book is Transaction Man, The Rise and Decline of the American Dream. Welcome to you both. Nick, um, you seem to be uh, somewhere rural. Where are you coming uh, to us yes, from? Yes, I am. I'm somewhere very rural. I'm in uh, a little village that nobody's ever heard of called Haynes Falls, New York, which is in upstate New York in the very northeast corner of the Catskill Mountains. And that's where I have been for the last four and a half going on five months because of uh, the coronavirus. Uh, so Transaction Man. Um, Tell us what it's ostensibly about and then what it's really about. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess, uh, I don't know if this is ostensibly or really, but it's the, the premise of the book is that there are a number of ways to organize a capitalist system. And the American capitalist system has been organized in a succession of fairly different ways over the last hundred years. So what I'm trying to do in the book is to propose a, a sort of history of the different big ideas by which American capitalism has been organized. I do this through a series of profiles and, and you know, of institutions, people, and places, and, and try to show you how different these versions are from each other. Um, and how uh, each has, you know, its good and bad sides. I'm arguing that there's three big phases in the American organization of the American economy over the last hundred years. I'm calling them institution-oriented, transaction-oriented, and network-oriented. Network-oriented is the one we may be in now, the era of the big tech companies dominating the economy. Um, I should say one other thing. Um, there's a famous old book called The Organization Man, published in 1957 by William White, a journalist at Fortune magazine. And my title is a sort of homage to his book and also trying to note how completely vanished the world that he was writing about, the world of big corporations that were going to live forever, dominating American life, American employment, and the political economy, how, how that world went away. Essentially, the story I'm trying to tell is what happened, you know, when White wrote the book and many other people writing in his era, this was a forever economic regime, and now it's gone. 
Um, so, uh, so that's kind of the story I'm telling. How did you get the idea to write the book? Or why did you write the book? What prompted you to go in that direction? Uh, it's a little bit of everything that's ever happened in my life. Um, I uh, am uh, no longer quite so young as I used to be. And um, I witnessed the trend. I was, I'm old enough to have been the last group in the organization man era, or at least that's what my generation thought we were entering when we entered the workplace. Um, my closest brush was that with that was working at the Washington Post where, where you've worked for so many years, Steve. And as you know, at least then, it was assumed that the minute you got in the door, you were going to be there until retirement, as long as you didn't screw up too badly. And the company would take care of you and you would do whatever the company said. Um, there and in many other ways, I, I witnessed all of the certainties that I grew up with go away about how, you know, an ordinary person would interact with the large structures of the economy. And it, it made me curious to find out, you know, what happened. Um, and just as a tiny example, I work at Columbia University. Um, so if you go back to uh, the 1950s and even into the 1960s um, and see who were the trustees at Columbia University, which is a sort of marker for who's in the establishment, it would be people who, primarily people who had started in a big corporation and rose up the ranks over the decades and then become the head of the corporation. Now, if you look, there's nobody like that in the Columbia trustees. And there's many examples. This is just like where I live institutionally. And it's essentially all people who do private equity, a field that didn't exist when I was young. So, I mean, I, 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 I asked myself the question, how did this happen? Who thought of it? Why did it happen? What have been the effects of it? So, uh, um, Nick, the first period is this this uh, organization man organizing principle, the institutional era. The last is the network era, the middle era. How did you describe that one? I would describe that as as um, essentially the rise of Wall Street and and. Um, you know, to use a more academic word, financialization as the governing principle of the economy. The financial firm I use as a principal example is Morgan Stanley. And, you know, as late as 1970, Morgan Stanley had something like 200 employees and it was a private partnership and people uh, like us on the screen who were kind of pundits writing about the state of the American economy often would say things like, Wall Street is vestigial and soon will not even exist um, because uh, uh, corporations are so powerful. Um, and now, you know, Morgan Stanley has been through lots of ups and downs, including the financial crisis, but it has north of 50,000 employees. It's one of the, you know, systemically important financial institutions, aka too big to fail, meaning it's sort of regulated by and guaranteed by the federal government. And, and the power has really shifted from uh, corporations that were thought to be able to do whatever they wanted to Wall Street firms and, and a financial system that, that dictates terms to corporations um, under the name of honoring shareholder value. Basics of healthcare, job security, and a, and a generous retirement pension. Uh, rather than the government. So as these second and third phases came on, that part of it, that social compact, got stripped out and, and created a world uh, of much more economic insecurity for middle-class Americans and working class. Um, so in a sense, in that early period, that so-called golden period, we. Uh, the greatest socialistic institutions in the United States were a large blue chip corporations that redistributed income and provided income security um, and, and took care of people. Um, and that was just assumed to be true. It wasn't anything written in law. It was just a norm yeah. of behavior that everyone expected. 
Right. It was written in the law of punditocracy. And so it's often <laughs> stated by people. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, there are many things about the, this age that weren't so golden. We can get into that if you want to. But just as an example, you know, Peter Drucker, uh, the famous management consultant and, and, uh, king of the business pundits for decades because he loved these sweeping statements. He wrote a book in the late 70s after this world was already falling apart, but he didn't notice yet, saying, guess what? America is the first, is now a socialist country. Um, and the reason is that uh, big corporations have these large pension funds and their unions, they were heavily unionized then, also have large pension funds. And these funds are the biggest actors in the stock market. So, you know, Karl Marx, if he were alive, would be happy because the workers own the means of production. So that was kind of a, a purple prose version of what you just said, stated right. by Peter Drug. Reaganland is a uh, detailed history of the failure of uh, the Jimmy Carter presidency and the victory uh, of Ronald Reagan in 1980. Um, that's ostensibly what it's about. Um, it's quite an extensive uh, volume, but those of you who could maybe see it, uh, um, almost 900 pages. Uh, so there's a lot there, very rich in detail. Well, what is it really about? What, is it, what are the underlying themes? Well, the important thing to understand is it's the fourth and final book of a series that I've been working on since 1997. And it actually dovetails nicely with what Nick was saying, because it starts in this moment of American capitalism and American society in which all the poobahs of opinion and uh, all the gatekeepers believe that we'd figured it out, uh, that we'd kind of come up with this nice equilibrium that kind of took care of people, uh, created wealth, uh, created stability in the world. And it was generally understood to be kind of a center left liberalism, that kind of the world was kind of converging where we were going to become more like Western Europe, uh, the, the ordeal of race was kind of uh, fading away as the South kind of joined the modern world. And that anyone who disagreed with this, whether on the left or on the right, was kind of nuts, right? So that was my first book called Before the Storm, Barry Goldwater and the Unmaking of the American Consensus. And it covered the years from 58 to 1964, in which the Republicans nominated someone who uh, uh, despise that consensus, Barry Goldwater, who represented these capitalists who thought this whole blue chip system of kind of guaranteed employment and kind of uh, an entente cordiale between labor and business and government was vile, socialistic. And uh, of course, Barry Goldwater lost in one of the biggest landslides to that point. And the book ends with the pundit saying conservatism is a complete dead letter in the American experience. And that if the Republicans don't completely purge this uh, conservative influence, that there might not be a Republican party. Something, by the way, that comes back again and again and again. I, I write about that happening uh, after Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, success too. And then the next book, Nixon Land, uh, is centered on the figure of Nixon and how he kind of weaponized the resentment of middle-class people towards all the social changes that were happening in the world. So, you know, Francis Ford Coppola said, you know, if you have a really good story, you should be able to summarize it in one word, right? And then The Godfather, he said, is succession, right? So go, uh, basically, Before the Storm was a book about organization, how this movement on the right organized to uh, become a political force. Nixon Land is about resentment, uh, you know, the kind of resentment we see from, say, a Sarah Palin. Uh, on the right, you know, that the, the liberal swells are all looking down their noses at us and they're a bunch of snobs and they don't understand anything. The next book, Invisible Bridge, uh, covers the rise of Reagan during the years of Watergate. And I would say the one word would be innocence. Uh, the basic storyline is that after Vietnam and after Watergate and after uh, the ordeal of uh, the Arab oil shock and stagflation and America realizing for the first time that it wasn't economically going to uh, stand astride the world like a colossus, there was an enormous ennui in American life, but also a very salutary kind of uh, citizenship in which people were really looking hard at whether uh, you know, the idea of America as the world's indispensable nation, which got us into Vietnam, uh, whether the idea of of um, 
you know, capitalism being this engine for continual growth. All these things were being kind of looked at in a very challenging way uh, all, all, all over the place um, in the organs, not only of, you know, kind of the left, but also in the center. And Ronald Reagan kind of comes along and says, no, America is God's chosen nation. It will always be God's chosen nation. Follow me and absolve you of this necessity of um, thinking dark thoughts about America, right? He, he runs for president in 1976 uh, for the Republican nomination against uh, you know, a sitting president in his own party, Gerald Ford, and loses. So that's that book. This book culminates with Ronald Reagan um, uh, winning the presidency. And uh, at least in, in, in one of its aspects, the economic and corporate aspect, the world that Nick uh, discusses in uh, the first section of Transaction Man really being on the way out in, in coalition with all sorts of other elements, right? So I write about Jerry Falwell, you know, um, turning uh, the pews of America into kind of precincts, you know? Uh, I write about um, the corporate world um, savagely uh, organizing against uh, the uh that entente cordiale i talked about in which basically they accepted the imperative of regulation and 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 harmony with labor you wrote about this too steve and then um finally uh there's this figure of ronald reagan right who uh has this striking charisma and this ability to kind of radiate confidence warmth optimism in a world in which president jimmy carter has kind of organized his own presidency around the idea that we have to do more with less, that we have to acknowledge the imperative of austerity, that government has gotten out of control, uh, basically you know, saw the world uh, as kind of a, a austere clapboard, uh, hardwood Baptist pew you know, of his childhood, uh, kind of 1930s Georgia. Uh, so this series of books um, endeavors to explain how America transformed itself over these uh, 30 years that it covers from a center left nation to a center right nation. By the time not only Ronald Reagan wins the presidency, but some very, very conservative senators uh, give the Republican party um, the Senate. After once again, in 1977, the pundits saying that if the Republicans don't purge the conservatives, the Republican party is gonna go out of business. Okay. Um, let me ask you about Reagan, and then I'll have some general questions for you. Um, Ronald Reagan, was he uh, a genius who captured the mood of the moment that you just described? Was he just a fraud uh, manipulator, or was he just a front man for these, these other groups? I mean, well, how, would you, how would you have us think about Ronald Reagan? I tell a story in the book that I got straight from the horse's mouth from Hendrik Hertzberg, who was a Carter speechwriter, and he said, um, our strategy was we knew that as soon as we got Ronald Reagan on a debate stage standing next to uh, Jimmy Carter, people would understand that Reagan was not intelligent, that he was not responsible, that he was old, he was decrepit, he was crazy, right? And of course, uh, they did, they were able to schedule one debate. They set up the rules so uh, Carter would have as much time as possible to rebut uh, uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, errors, mistakes, lies, if you prefer. And they went into that debate five days before the election tied. And Ronald Reagan won in a landslide, uh, long story short. I actually found a mem memo from um, Jimmy Carter's advertising uh, coordinator, um, basically arguing that um, the entire strategy of the campaign was to demonstrate that Jimmy Carter was smarter than Ronald Reagan, right? Uh, well. Uh, that turned out to be not a very good stage, uh, uh, very good strategy. I would say basically uh, how I would evaluate that 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 question is uh, that there are lots of kinds of intelligence, right? Uh, you know, he probably couldn't have done calculus, uh, but he had an incredible gift for reading a crowd and reading the mood of uh, a constituency and the public. And uh, he had some very firmly held beliefs that were based on his own reading and study. Uh, he was not very uh, fluid and supple in changing those beliefs. Uh, and uh, yet at the same time, um, 
he was also, and this can be rendered in an insulting way or a, a generous way. The insulting way is, yes, he was very good at taking direction, uh, just like he learned when he was, you know, a Hollywood contract player. The other is said that he had the discipline and maturity to grasp that there were some things, some people who knew better than him on some subjects and that he should defer to them. And I have all kinds of stuff in the book uh, comparing, for example, the letters that his staff prepared for him to sign uh, to uh, New York Times columnists and scholars that made him sound like a distinguished mainstream intellectual. And then there were the letters he um, dictated to his friends in which he pondered the consequences of uh, prophecy in the book of Revelation for what's going on in the Middle East, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, sent letters to Gene Dixon, uh, the newspaper psychic. So uh, I don't really kind of come down in any kind of dogmatic way on it, but it's like a lot, like, like historians like to say, it's, it's a complicated question. Um, so here's a question for both of you. Um, you essentially um, write about the, the sort of uh, move from uh, this era of uh, consensus, uh, sort of center-left consensus with big corporations being at the, at the center of a, of a system that created uh, uh, prosperity, a widely distributed prosperity. And this fell apart in the late 1970s. Um, and my question, uh, you all, you both seem to suggest that this was a, a moment at which the country took a wrong turn. And yet you also both lay out um, in great detail why it wasn't working in 1978, uh, why it had not worked for the previous uh, decade in terms economically, politically, in terms of our faith and institutions. So, um, Explain to me this, this tension between uh, the old system was beginning to come apart. The United States economy was becoming uncompetitive. Our political system was un unwinding. Um, and yet, it, uh, so we decided to take a turn. We needed to do something different. And we did do yeah. something different. But your argument is that we did the wrong thing. Is it not? Um, so let me start by saying I write as a penitent to some extent. I was a young liberal journalist in Washington at the time that we're talking about, and I regarded these changes with tremendous enthusiasm. Um, as a young writer for the Washington Monthly, I argued for the world that I'm now <laughs> saying was a wrong turn, as you say. So I've had a lot of time to reflect on what we got wrong in those days. And I'm not talking about conservatives. I'm talking about sort of centrist liberals like myself. Um, we're now called, we're now called, and I'm one of them too, by the way, Nick, we're called neoliberals now, which is, right. a, which, which is uh, uh, not, not, not a, uh, a nice thing to say to someone anymore. But anyway. Right. And that was a word relentlessly promoted by the aforementioned Charlie Peters of the Washington Monthly, thinking everyone would embrace it. And, and uh, you know, it, it, and then now it's turned into a, a negative. We, um, we, we, it was unimaginable, two, two or three things quickly, and then Rick will want to come in. One is we all believed exactly what Rick said, that conservatism has died and that it was un inconceivable that Reagan would ever be president. Um, so what we thought was the problem was, I'm using the terminology of my book that, that sort of institutions and interest groups were a bad thing in politics. And, and that if you had a politics that was oriented toward, quote, doing the right thing as determined by sort of technocratic elites, then you would have all the major problems that you alluded to, Steve, solved and an enduring social and political order. And I think that assumption, just sort of a structural assumption in a way, was 100% wrong. That is what I'm a penitent about. So we were always saying, well, you know, if you could get rid of unions, then, you know, you could have really a good life for workers. And if you could get rid of regulations, then you could, you know, really reform business. And, you know, it was all that kind of thinking. We were 
very happy with this shift from corporate economy to a market economy. And we, we just didn't see a lot of things coming, including one, uh, the rise of conservatism and two, um, a kind of the dramatic rise in inequality, which is global and is related to all these things. And, and, and that if you sort of destructure the political economy, that would be a consequence. It seems obvious at the time, but it was not to penitents like myself. So, Rick, what would you say to that? I, I don't, I'm not sure anyone ever called you a neoliberal, Rick. So uh, uh, what would you say about the wrong turn? Sure, I would answer the question in a political way. Uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons everything went south in the 1970s is that people didn't grasp that the whole system was built on the cheapness and plentifulness of this one resource, petroleum, uh, that turned out to be controlled by actual human beings, right? Who had actual interests of their own in the Middle East and they decided to basically uh, throw their weight around. And, uh, you know, at the cusp of the Arab oil boycott in 1973, people were talking about things like energy being too, too cheap to meter, right? Uh, and once you have something that is not a factor of production that anyone considered particularly important, and suddenly it's, 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 it's uh, the tail that wags the whole global economy's dog, right? We can see that in retrospect, right? Um, you know, why did inflation happen? Why did so much convulsion happen in the global economy? I think a lot of it was this one-time thing, right? In which uh, a part of the world that had no, basically that, you know, Iran was like a colony of the United States. Saudi Arabia was like a colony of the United States. All these nations decided that they were gonna, you know, basically speak up for themselves. And one of the things that happened when these convulsions were happening and all this inflation was happening, was that people took advantage of this, right? People, political actors acted with will and intelligence in order to say, look at these terrible things that are happening. Here's why they are happening. Here's why they will continue to happen. And here's what they, we, we need to do to stop them happening. And those were people basically uh, on the corporate right. And one of the things that they were able to say was, inflation is caused by um, too much government, by too much spending. By, by budget deficits. And Jimmy Carter very much with his austerity ideology bought into that too. Now we know in retrospect that that was one of the most insanely wrong things that smart people have ever believed, that we now have 2% inflation and massive government de deficits. So these people, by making a very compelling and strong political argument that people, all sorts of people, people at the Washington Monthly and people at the National Review and people in the White House, both the Carter and Ford White House, we're able to buy, we're able to say, we need to cut government. We need to cut the social safety net. We need to uh, right the ship. We need to uh, have tight money. We love Paul Volcker, right? That was caused untold misery. That was completely unnecessary because of a bad idea that political actors who had interests advanced very effectively. They didn't only advance it very effectively by making economic arguments and often very propagandistic and, 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 and false economic arguments, as I show in the book, lots of dishonesty in that world, but they did so by joining in coalition with a Christian right that, you know, while it was quite economically conservative too, didn't necessarily have the same interests. So what I'm talking about is the pulling together of a political coalition. And I think that um, how that could have, um, gone a different way is uh, that political coalition uh, being uh, rooted out and defeated, right? Uh, hindsight is 2020, but that was probably a time in which we needed more social democracy and not less, you know, more security for ordinary Americans. And that would have required a redistribution of power in the society. And uh, unfortunately, um, the one guy who was making that argument uh, Ted Kennedy was a pretty poor messenger. That's a pretty fun story to tell in the book too. Um, and, um, you know, we're kind of left with, um, by the way, one of the, one of the biggest surprises in the book in the 1980 election, we, we think of 1980 as this great mandate mandate for Reagan and he emerges as a shining hero was the enormous apathy. You know, one of my favorite documents that I found was a political cartoon of a guy on election day and it's his feet dangling from behind the curtain because you saw the three choices. John Anderson, who was also very big, he wanted a 50% gas tax. 
uh, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan and he hung himself. Um, so. <laughs> so, so uh, Rick, let me, do you think then that the world would have been better off if um, the major industrial unions had become stronger rather than weaker, that, that we had closed off the American economy to trade, which is what they wanted, that we had kept regulation of the airlines, right. that we had kept regulations of right. natural gas. You want you think that the world would have the United States would have been stronger in the long run if we'd done all those things? Well, the unions not only became weaker, they also uh, abandoned organizing, right? I mean, uh, George Meany cut the organizing department, right? So, um, yeah, I think workers having more power probably would have done a better job of if unions could have gone to the negotiating table with government and business and, and said, look, we want you, you know, in a corporatist way, negotiate a contract between the three of us that is good for everybody. Uh, as far as, you know, airline deregulation, one of the consequences of that is Lots of small towns in America don't have airline service anymore. Here's my question for you. Is it possible that in fact we were uh, right, Nick, you and I were right in 1980, that there did need to be, the pendulum did move, need to be moved uh, back in a different direction, that we did do that, that the United States economy did recover uh, uh, its edge and its entrepreneurial vigor in the late 1980s, uh, and that things were actually pretty, pretty good in the early 1990s, but then the pendulum went too far in the wrong direction. So that it was a necessary corrective; it just was taken too far. Is that possible, Nick and Rick? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I would like to frame it in a somewhat different way. But it, you know, what? Well, let's talk about. Let's go forward to to the 21st century. Um, if we all agree that the pendulum swung in one direction, then it kept swinging too far. Um, and I think we can all agree that now in the U.S. and elsewhere, we're in a sort of global rebellion against this order whose creation we're talking about. So, so that's a, a major political fact. As many have noted, uh, Joe Biden is running as the farthest to the left Democratic presidential nominee, which for those who've been following him for a long time is massively counterintuitive and surprising. Um, but the most to the left on these economic issues in many decades. So th there's the, the, the voters are pushing the elites to be more attentive to their interests. I think what I didn't see at the time was that, uh, pulling all these restraints off the economy was going to engineer a large amount of inequality um, that that uh, has been the obsessive fact of the politics of US and Europe for a good 10 years now, if not more. And, and um, it's a little bit like Lucy and the football in, in the um, old Peanuts cartoon. It's sort of, you know, we neoliberals were saying if, 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 you know, or not so much we, but the people we were allied with were saying to us, we promise if you take all these restraints away, we will retain a fiery commitment to a just society. But then, you know, it felt like the football got pulled away and that didn't happen. And so back in, in the late seventies, I was had too much faith in a society that was made very fluid and without the kind of uh, you know safety nets and restraints that I now think are required to create a good society that works for everybody. But let me ask a, a, a final question, uh, Nick. You uh, said one of the things that we thought several times was that conservatism was going to be dead, and it, Turns out, gee, gee, it wasn't. Now, election today, they're looking at Trump and they say, ah, finally, this is this is that conservatism that has reached the end of its rope, and now it will be dead and buried after this election. What a lot of people are saying that you're shaking your head. What do you want? Do you want to tell us? I want to tell you uh, 
really, really be careful if you live in a kind of liberal bubble. I don't know about you guys, but I do in my daily life. Um, really be careful about assuming that if you are a liberal, that conservatism is now dead and the whole country is liberal. That, you know, this is a big, complicated, ever-changing country. Uh, Rick captures that very well in his book with lots of elements, lots of surprises. Um, as, as Rick points out, you know, we were not sitting around in Washington saying in 1977, the greatest threat to the whole order we're interested in is uh, Christian academies in the South, which are going to become the platform for, you know, organizing a hugely effective conservative movement. So, you know, they're out there. They're not in plain sight. And, 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 and. Please do not be complacent and think about a politics that appeals to ordinary working people, not just to elites and their own notions of what a just society is. Just the last thing, I had a real wake up. I mean, Rick, you've, you've been to Chicago Lawn, right? And, and uh, mm -hmm. so there was a Lots person whose character who sort of starts the book, uh, um, an auto dealer named Nick Dandrea, who got kind of xed out in the gm reorganization so he was showing me he and his wife were showing me around the neighborhood they took me to this auto repair shop you know in what had become a black neighborhood run by a white guy just a little auto repair shop you know like sanford and son or something and this is summer of 2015 and this guy i could not get out of the auto repair shop because he was telling me how great donald trump was you know, I live in Morningside Heights, Upper West Side, New York. I don't meet that kind of person. And I spent two, three hours with this guy. And, you know, you can argue whether he was he right or was he wrong, but it made a huge impression on me that he loved Trump. He felt Trump spoke for him. There was a passion there. And I came home and I said to a lot of my friends and family, you know, don't count this guy out because he's, He's touching something that people feel. And and Rick, do you do you you've studied the conservative movement? Do you think that the conservative movement now is is in deep trouble with the uh, with this coming election, and that uh, that liberal ascendancy is uh, is we're on the cusp of that, or are you not feeling that? Well, I mean, I think the biggest danger in talking about the upcoming election is only talking about in terms of elections. I mean, the, the, the crisis we're looking at now is it's not just uh, the way we've looked at elections in all of our lifetimes of how many votes a candidate gets in what state. It's a question of whether, you know, 40 percent of the country is going to consider the election legitimate. Right. I mean, the, 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 the parallels we need to think of is what, you know, Chile looked like in 1970 or, you know, Berlin in 1932, not just, you know, what are the, you know, the, 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 the balances of forces between, you know, Democrats and Republicans and which electoral coalitions they're going to be going for. Uh, you know, conservatism doesn't go, go away because conservatism is part of the human state, a state. It's part of the way Americans think and feel and identify themselves in the world. Um, but, uh, you know, the question now is, you know, whether the institutions of American democracy and small R republicanism uh, can survive one of our political parties, you know, surrendering, surrendering itself to authoritarianism. I mean, really, that's the question. Okay. Well, um, I want to thank you uh, both, uh, Rick Perlstein and Nick Lemon, for uh, joining us on this uh, session of the National Book Festival brought to you by the Library of Congress. Uh, it was a good conversation, and thanks to all of you who are watching for joining us. Have a good Thank day. Thank you. Cheers.